Hi, friends of the planet, Nero here. Today, we're really excited to have with us John Milko, who is the policy advisor for the Climate and Energy Program at Third Way. And today, John is with us to talk about a new report that Third Way put out titled How to Create One Million Jobs While Advancing Climate Goals, which is part of the Decarb America Initiative. And John, thank you so much for being with us today to talk about jobs, which is at the top of mind for lots of people. Of course, my pleasure, Mira. Thank you for having me. And so I wanted to ask, there are a lot of numbers floating around about how many jobs can be created through public policy spending on things like infrastructure and the clean energy revolution. And so how in your analysis did you arrive at your number? Like President Biden said in his address last night, when I think about climate change, I think jobs. We know how important decarbonization is for the health of our planet and for its people, but often overlooked is the generational opportunity we have to drive economic growth and create jobs for all types of work across the country. So that opportunity is something we wanted to capture and communicate. We worked with our partner organizations, Bipartisan Policy Center, Clean Air Task Force, and Industrial Economics to model the impacts of 20 clean energy, transportation, innovation, and infrastructure policies with funding levels and spending windows based on existing proposals or projected needs. And what we found is roughly $750 billion in investments across these policies creates over a million annual jobs through 2026. How did we arrive at these estimates? Without getting too into the weeds, we used an, an input output model that measures how a positive or negative change in one industry, and in this case positive, affects the broader economy. It was developed by a group affiliated with the University of Maryland in Forum and used by different federal agencies to estimate the impact of various policy changes. These economic models can take a given investment and tell us what the economic and jobs impact is in the targeted industry and other industries as well. And it's not a perfect estimate, much like weather forecasts aren't 100% right. predictive of the actual weather, but it roughly shows the job potential and the geographic distribution of these jobs and helps us tell the story of economic opportunity that these policies present. One thing that caught my eye in this report is that all jobs are not equal. So it's not everyone is going to be out there holding the welding torch. And so there was a difference between jobs that are direct, indirect, and induced is how your report explained them. So can you talk a little bit more about what that means? As you mentioned, direct, indirect, and induced are the three categories. Direct captures the jobs that are created by the policies directly. Indirect are jobs created in adjacent supply chains and induced are jobs created by increased economic activity given new investment. So to use an example of new transit, which was one of our policies, direct jobs would be the workers employed to lay the tracks for new trains and building the train cars. The indirect jobs are created by manufacturers of the steel used for the tracks and the, and the cars or makers of the electrical equipment used in those train cars. And induced would capture jobs created say by a new restaurant that opens along a new train route. So it's a broad ranging picture of what these investments can create. Yeah. And I think it goes to show that there is something for everyone there. So I, the president, yeah. to your point, addressed that in his speech last night, where he said, if you're worried if these jobs aren't for you, they are there. There really seems to be, you know, an opportunity for lots of different Americans to feel the benefits of these investments. So that's great. But I, one thing I did want to ask, and I've heard this talked about before, and it's often a counterpoint to investment. How permanent are these jobs? You know, oftentimes when we think of a win turbine perhaps being built or a wind farm. There are certainly a lot of jobs to build that project, but once it's done, there may not be as many workers needed to maintain it. So can you talk a little bit about the permanence that you came to in your research and analysis? The short answer is it, it ranges for each policy, right? Mm -hmm. um, our study focuses on the jobs created in the actual building of this infrastructure within the given spending window, which in the case of many of these policies is five years. It does not include operations and maintenance jobs that will last beyond the spending window. So to go back to new transit, the employees driving the trains and performing track maintenance will have jobs long after the construction of 
these new transit projects. Our model does not capture those jobs as well as the sustained economic activity across the country that results from, from capital investments. So to use another example, demonstration policies, there are early stage technologies that project to play an important role in the new clean economy. Once they reach a more mature stage of commercialization, they'll employ more people. Given all this, I would say our estimates are conservative because we know these policies will support a litany of new jobs beyond the spending windows that our study focuses on. One other thing that came up last week was a new white paper that the Council of Economic Advisors put out. In there, the takeaway was that the federal government is the key component that's needed to ensure that our green energy and green economy transition happens at the scale we need to address climate change and provide all these jobs, and also that it's equitable. So can you talk a little bit about how your research might fit in into the analysis that CEA came to? So the first thing I'll say is that markets have been moving towards a clean energy future rapidly over the past few years with the exponential growth of green bond markets and private sector pledges to decarbonize operations and investment portfolios, which is great. However, the scale of this transformation cannot be done without the government, as the Council of Economic Advisors report explains. It's crucial to have federal policies facilitate this transition. And as you mentioned at the top, th this study was just one project under a larger initiative of Decarb America. And what we do in that initiative is model the types of policies it would take to reach net zero by 2050. It's very clear from those studies, which I encourage viewers to, to visit the website, decarbamerica.org. We'll um, link it down below in this video when you're watching it. <laughs> perfect. I think it's very clear from those studies, as well as others from Princeton and MIT and elsewhere, the federal government is needed to establish policies to accelerate this transition, like clean energy standards, for example, and help finance the large scale infrastructure that private entities cannot undertake alone. I think demonstration policies help illustrate this point. Given their early stage technology, they're a higher risk than the private sector is often comfortable with. A famous example is an innovative car company that received a low interest government loan 10 years ago and benefited from subsequent government rebates for their cars. And that company, Tesla, is now the largest auto company in the world by market cap and has helped spur auto companies to build out their electric vehicle offerings, which will go a long way to decarbonizing the transportation sector. Another example would be transmission lines, we need to build out a grid system to handle a surge in new clean electricity. And the timeline we have to reach net zero, it will not happen without supportive federal policy. Going back to your question about equity, that's another important role for the government to play to make sure that it is making place-based policies that ensure all communities, rural, suburban, urban, black, white, brown, workers across the socioeconomic spectrum benefit from this transition. And the government has historically not been as successful as we'd like to see it considering equity during large-scale economic transitions. The New Deal was transformed but left out a lot of people and a lot of communities. So the Biden-Harris administration is highly attuned to that and making great effort to consider those impacts as we make these investments in, in a clean energy future. And in order to do it and do it right, where all communities and demographics benefit, it takes intentional policymaking, which can only be done at the federal level. We can choose where to put much of this investment to ensure vulnerable communities share in this economic growth. New Mexico is a rural state undergoing a shift from fossil fuel to a clean economy, large growth in renewable energy sources like wind and solar. The growth has outpaced the demand of its own relatively small state and therefore needs the infrastructure to be able to create jobs at home and export clean energy throughout the country to markets like California and Arizona. And they're hardly the only state or the only community that would benefit from federal investment, which is why thoughtful, intentional policymaking is so important in this effort. Yeah, I think that the line that the president used in his address last night was that the transition is going to be instead of top down from bottom out. So that, that seems to be the theme to ensure that as many people are benefiting from the impacts of this investment and can also be a part of it and, you know, create jobs and kind of create the new state economies and national economy of the future. So 
thank you so much for breaking that down for us. I know we hear jobs, jobs, jobs floating around a lot out there, but I think it's really important to kind of key in on, on what that means and how these jobs are created and what's needed from our lawmakers and people in Washington to get it done. Thank you so much, John, for, for sitting down with us today. Thank you so much for providing an uh, opportunity to, to talk more about it. We uh, can never have enough opportunities. Yeah, we hope to have you back soon. I'm sure we'll have plenty more questions. Perfect. Thanks, John.